Next on BBC One, the Rough Justice team opens another file that could reveal a miscarriage of justice. Yeah. The police claim to investigate crime with an open mind. But this is the story of how detectives closed their minds to all but one suspect. In doing so, they broke the rules designed to protect the innocent. In summer, the North Wales resort of Colwyn Bay teems with holidaymakers. In the depths of winter, Colwyn is a ghost town. Strangers are few and far between. They stand out in stark contrast to the locals. During the last week of January 1991, one stranger in particular was attracting attention at a building society on the Abigail Road. One of the staff shouted that they wanted some help. They were concerned about an individual who was standing outside. They were counting the day's take in order to do the banking. He looked suspicious and they were obviously concerned that somebody should be taking such an interest in the money. On the afternoon of Friday, February the 1st, at another building society, the Halifax, just up the road, the manager and her assistant had just finished serving two customers. It was around 10 to 4. I saw the same man standing outside just to the right of our door. He was facing the street. I was so nervous about him that I'd taken £1,000 in £20 notes from Mrs Jones's till. He ran towards the counter and then jumped onto it. He said, fill it up, all of it. The man then pointed the knife towards me and said, just the notes, no coins. He took the bag off me and jumped back down. As he walked out, he said, you won't see me again. I ran from behind the counter to the front door and looked up Abigail Road. I couldn't see any trace of him. The robber got away with only 600 pounds. But two women in late middle age in a peaceful seaside resort had been held at the point of a knife in fear of their lives. The police had very little to go on. They had no forensic evidence like clothes fibers or fingerprints. All they had at first were the eyewitness accounts of two very frightened women. At the police station, Kathleen Roberts, the manager, and her assistant, Idea Jones, compiled two photo fit pictures of their attacker. They were remarkably similar to one another. The police thought they looked like a man well known to them, Paul Berry. If the police were right, a small-time crook had suddenly become more ambitious. Paul Berry's always been a bit of a con man and, you know, petty theft, but nothing serious. Maybe renting the old TV set and video recorder from a shop and selling it on and, you know, not taking it back and, you know, just basic petty theft, you know, and, you know, maybe a credit card every now and again, but, you know, nothing major serious. Hello, Paul. On the Monday, three days after the robbery, the police found Rill Paul Berry at his new flat in Rill. Inside, if possible. Detective Constable Coy was in charge of the investigation. He later wrote down what he claimed Berry said. Hi, Paul. I'm investigating an incident that occurred on the afternoon of Friday last, the 1st of February 1991. Where were you then? Last Friday. Yeah, with the little one. What, all day? Yeah, I think so. Well, the incident I'm referring to happened at the Halifax Building Society, Old Colwyn. Don't even know where that is, mate. How long have you lived here? Only a couple of days. And when did you move here? About. Wednesday, Thursday. Listen, mate, I've done no robbery. Who mentioned robbery? Well, what was it then? You tell me. To the police, the mention of the word robbery was the accidental admission of a guilty man. 
But Paul Berry claims that wasn't how the conversation went. He says the police told him they were investigating a theft. He admits using the word robbery, but says it's a word he used to describe all sorts of crimes. He also admitted he had been to Colwyn and back on the day in question. Where was that, Paul? Well, we left real about 2.30. Got back about 4, 4.15. Well, I have reason to believe that you may have committed a robbery in old no. Colwyn at 3.55 that day. That's not my style. You know that. Well, anyway, you're under arrest on suspicion of robbery. Do you understand? Paul Berry agreed to appear at two identification parades. Did you move down there? At the first parade, two witnesses picked him out. One was the assistant at the building society, Idea Jones, who was also one of the victims of the robbery. The other was Bethan Roberts, the customer who'd left the building society moments before. But Paul Berry continued to protest his innocence and, when interviewed by the police, elaborated on his alibi. The robbery took place at about 3.55, a time when Berry said he was ferrying his girlfriend Cindy and his two sons from a hostel in Colwyn to a hotel 12 miles away in Rill. We had our youngest Daniel with us when we got to Colwyn Bay about quarter to three. Cindy wanted to get some of her stuff from the hostel where she used to stay, so I took the youngest off to collect my son from school. Uh -huh. I got back to the hostel. I spoke to the woman in charge there. And then we all went back to Colwyn Bay Station, get the train to Rill. We had a load of Cindy's stuff with us, some clothes and a bin bag and a kid's bike. When we got back to Rill, it was starting to rain, so we waited for a taxi to take us to Cindy's hotel in Aquarium Street. What time did you get the train? About half three. 25 to 4. And uh, what time was it when you got to Rill? About 4 ish. Now listen, Paul. We've got two identicates of the robber, right? And we think they look like you. Oh. I know for a fact they were wrong. Interview terminated 3.23. Paul Berry's alibi appeared to stand up. Three independent witnesses came forward to confirm his movements that critical afternoon. According to their evidence, he simply could not have been in Colwyn Bay and in Rill, 12 miles further along the coast, at one and the same time. For nearly four weeks, the police couldn't break this alibi. Then they had a stroke of luck. A prisoner on remand with Berry turned grass. Paul Crewe told the police Berry had confessed to him, and he provided the answer to how Berry could have got to Rill so quickly. He got on the back of someone on a motorbike. He only said uh, he was a mate of mine. It was a big bike because uh, he got back to Rill in 10 minutes or so after the job was done. Uh, okay. Paul Berry went on trial in September 1991. The prosecution claimed he'd planned carefully. Desperate for money to reunite his family, he'd spied out a vulnerable target. Two witnesses, Bethan Roberts and Idea Jones, would identify him as having staged the robbery at 10 to 4. No, no coins, just notes. He'd escaped with an unnamed accomplice on a waiting motorcycle. The journey to Rill, 12 miles away, would have taken around 15 minutes by the police's own calculations. Enough time, the prosecution said, to change clothes, join his family at Rill railway station, and to catch a taxi. The impression would be he had just got off the train. The fact he could afford the taxi fare, said the prosecution, suggested he was flush with money. 
So finely balanced was the evidence for and against Paul Berry, it took three trials to convict him. At the first, the jury simply couldn't make up its mind. There was no verdict. The second trial was suddenly abandoned when it emerged that identification evidence had been tainted because the police had broken the rules designed to prevent miscarriages of justice. At the third trial, the police admitted they'd broken the rules, but said the breaches were innocent mistakes. The judge told the jury it didn't matter why the police had broken the rules, what the jury had to decide was whether the evidence of identification was reliable. The jury decided it was and convicted Paul Berry. He was jailed for seven years. But when Rough Justice examined the case, we felt that the police's attitude to their investigation raised so many questions, their evidence against Paul Berry was far less convincing than the jury had been led to believe. From the start of the investigation, the identification evidence was a mass of contradictions. He was wearing a whitish coloured bomber jacket. Wearing a bomber type jacket, dark in colour. He had a neatly trimmed moustache. His face was clean shaven, but he may have had a moustache. He was unshaven with about a centimetre of growth on his chin and top lip. All the same, the witnesses were able to compile two photo fit pictures, which the police said looked like Paul Berry. And that's how he became their prime suspect. But the police were already on a slippery slope. The Home Office's own figures suggest that photo fits prove crucial to solving crimes in only about 5% of occasions. On 45% of occasions, photo fit pictures bear little or no resemblance to the person who is subsequently convicted of the crime. In my experience of miscarriages of justice, the most common problem is that the police prematurely focus on one individual as the only possible suspect and then go out to seek evidence to convict him. There was a problem with the photo fit because, however closely it resembled Paul Berry, it was nothing like the lurker seen planning the robbery two days earlier. Did Mr Berry bear any resemblance? to the man you'd seen lurking outside your office? Well, as I saw him, he had the same sort of physical stance and, and uh, manner, but um, the man I saw in the, uh, the dock of Colin Bay Magistrates Court, Mr Berry, as you call him, was too fine-featured, too clean, too neat to be, in my view, the same person. What can you say about the photo fits that you saw and Mr. Berry. One looked remarkably like the chap I saw in the dock a couple of days later. The photo fit looked like Mr. Berry. It had the same sort of moustache, yes. So the photo fit looked like Mr. Berry, but you're quite sure in your own mind that Mr. Berry did not look like the lurker. Well, um, well yes. Just how precarious the identification evidence was can be gauged from the results of the two identity parades. Although Idea Jones picked out Paul Berry, her colleague, Kathleen Roberts, did not. And Kathleen Roberts had seen her attacker, not only during the robbery, but also lurking in the street several days before. The fact is, not one of the four witnesses who saw the lurker picked out Berry. Patrick Roberts saw the robber moments before he raided the building society, but he picked out an innocent member at the ID parade. His wife, Bethan, did pick out Berry, but then failed to recall whether or not he had a moustache. However, all the witnesses did agree on one thing, the robber's height. He was five foot ten. He was five ten. He was six feet tall. He was about 5'10 or 6 feet tall. He was 5'10 uh, or 5'11. By contrast, Paul Berry is much <coughs> taller. Six foot four, in fact. But his height was deliberately disguised at the first ID parade. He was told to sit down, which may explain why Idea Jones picked him out. She said her attacker was 5'10 and she had her own special way of measuring this. How tall is Mr. Jones, your husband? My husband? Five feet eleven. Five feet eleven. 
And I think he's here today, isn't he? Yes. So when you assess a man's height, you have as a reference point your husband's height. You could see that. Yes, well, you've been married a long time, I'm sure, and you've seen rather a lot of Mr. Jones over the years. So he would have been this man, slightly shorter than your husband. Yes. The one feature which makes Barry very, very distinctive is his extreme height, six foot four, feature probably shared by, by less than 2% of the, of the population. Professor Davis is a forensic psychologist and an advisor to the Home Office on identification procedure. He conducted an experiment for rough justice to see if unusual height was a feature that victims of a robbery could be expected to remember. I commissioned my postgraduate students to stop people at random in the street and ask them directions. And lurking around the next corner was another of our, our postgraduate students who asked them about the appearance of the person who had stopped them. The person we used was over six foot three. So in other words, they weren't as tall as Barry, but they were getting on that way. When asked to describe the individual, over half of them spontaneously mentioned his extreme height. And when we actually asked them directly what their height was, over 80% said that that person was over six foot. And the fact that none of the witnesses in the Berry case mentioned that the person was, was of that height, I think is very interesting and suggests that the person that they saw was not Berry. We are not suggesting Idea Jones consciously misidentified Paul Berry. But the fact is, miscarriages by misidentification are so notorious that judges routinely warn juries about the dangers. That's also why Parliament has imposed strict rules to control the way the police handle identification witnesses. In the case of Bethan Roberts, the second witness to identify Paul Berry, the police broke every rule in the book. The rules are contained in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, known as PACE. By the time of the Berry case, they'd been in force five years. They prohibit photographs being shown to witnesses once the police have fastened on a suspect. We know of a number of instances of verifiable miscarriages of justice which have been based on witnesses being shown photographs of the accused prior to a parade and then picking out the person in the photograph rather than the actual person who committed the crime. In Paul Berry's case, the police broke the rules right from the start. Berry had become their prime suspect on the Saturday morning after the robbery because the police said he looked like the photo fits. Breach number one came that Saturday morning when Detective Constable Langston showed Bethan Roberts and her husband an album of mugshots. He looks a bit, a bit like a Breach number two was the failure by DC Langston to record what was shown to them. Breach number three came when the album was shown to both husband and wife together. This could have allowed each witness to influence the other's recollection. The fourth breach was the following Monday, the day before Barry was put on an ID parade. OK, Mrs Roberts, take your time. Beth and Roberts was again shown photographs, this time by DC Coy. One of the photographs was Barry. His picture was in a gallery of 12 compiled by Coy. Definitely. You sure? She picked him out, but then the way the pictures were arranged Wait. made that very likely. Beth and Roberts had been quite confident that she had seen a man with brown eyes. Nine of the 12 photographs on the photo board were people with blue eyes. So at one stroke, she could have discarded three quarters of the faces on the photo board. Of the three individuals with brown eyes on the photo board, one of them, only one of them, was photographed against a cell wall. That was Barry. So the whole photo board could, as it were, have directed her attention to his photograph. In other words, 
despite the best efforts of the police, it was not a fair test of her ability to identify the accused. Nevertheless, she was then allowed to go on an identity parade. Contrary to the pace codes, she was shown the, his photograph prior to the parade, and we have no way of knowing whether her identification of Berry at that parade was based on her memory of him in the building society, which is the inference the prosecution would wish us to draw, or whether, in my view, equally likely, it was based on her selection of his photograph in the photo board. In court, DC Coy denied that the police had deliberately tried to program identification witnesses by showing them photographs of Paul Berry before the identification parades. He said any pace breaches were accidental. And yet, when he and DC Langston were pressed about the large number of breaches, their memories deserted them. Indeed, both DC's Coy and Langston clean forgot some events altogether. You can recall very little about that Saturday morning. That is right, isn't it? You cannot recall showing photographs? No. To Beth Ann Roberts? I can't recall. I've been told it's more than likely that I was the person who did, but I can't recall showing them. And you were not told by Detective Constable Coy that he suspected the defendant, Mr. Berry? No, I wasn't. Quite sure? Absolutely. DC Coy did not fare much better. In his statement, he gave the wrong chronology of events. He recorded Monday's showing of Berry's photograph to Beth and Roberts as having happened two days earlier on the Saturday, the day after the robbery. I showed her the board and asked her to look carefully and see whether or not the man that she'd seen on the previous day outside the Halifax Building Society, Old Colwyn, was included. By recording Beth and Roberts as having seen the photo of Berry on the Saturday rather than the Monday, the police could argue they'd conformed to pace. The record suggested that Berry legitimately became the prime suspect, not on the basis of a mere photofit likeness, but because of a photographic identification two whole days rather than two hours before he was arrested. At 12 midday on Monday the 4th of February, in the company of WPC Jones, I visited Brighton Road where I saw Paul Berry. DC Coy eventually had to correct this inaccurate account of events, but only after he'd been forced into an embarrassing series of admissions in court. You made a statement dated the 26th of February 1991. Uh, does that document bear your signature? Yes, it does, sir. It does. Does it say that at 10.12 on Saturday you produced photographs for the attention of Beth Ann Roberts? Yes, it does, sir. Why? I do have, seem to have, from the onset, confused the days after the event with Monday the 4th of February, two days later. Are you saying today is the first opportunity you've had to correct it? All I can say, sir, is that I read it and I did not see the mistake in order to correct it. DC Coy's statement wasn't the only one that was mistaken. The showing of Berry's photo to Beth and Roberts was witnessed by Sergeant Clayton. His statement also incorrectly recorded that it took place not on Monday, but on Saturday. And did you write Sergeant Clayton's statement for him? I may have written the statement for Sergeant Clayton to read, and if he agreed with it, to sign. You are suggesting that he is a careless sort of sergeant who, in an investigation as serious as this, would just sign by form of rubber stamp, in fact, and make out a statement which was inaccurate. That is correct. So, your sergeant is inaccurate and you are inaccurate? Yes. There was yet one further breach of the PACE regulations and a more blatant breach would be hard to find. 
After Paul Berry had been arrested, now self-evidently the only suspect, DC Coy once again showed photographs to witnesses who he hoped might pick out Berry at an identification parade. DC Coy and another officer visited the offices of the solicitor, whose staff had seen the lurker just two days before the robbery. What were the two detectives doing in your office? Showing two members of staff, uh, a group of photographs, and uh, I believe at least one photo fit picture. Did they invite your members of staff to appear on an identity parade? I can't recall that ever happening, but I assume it did because they did, in fact, go. The prosecution's evidence was flawed because of the number of violations of the basic principles of identification procedures as laid out in the PACE codes. Have you ever come across this number of breaches of PACE? In my experience, no. I, I think this case is in my experience, quite unique for the number of failures to follow PACE guidelines. These are not, as it were, minor deviations from procedure. They are quite serious deviations, each of which in itself could be responsible for a misidentification. In all, there were no fewer than six breaches of the PACE rules designed to prevent miscarriages of justice by misidentification. Although the police denied they tried to cover up those breaches, the fact is the evidence of identification was tainted. After the police charged Paul Berry based solely on that tainted evidence, they began to check out his alibi. They found it rather hard to break, and so did we, because it seemed very likely to be true. <laughs> Berry's account of his movements that afternoon begins at around 2.30, when he arrived at the Greenfield Road Hostel in Colwyn Bay to collect his common-law wife, Cindy Abbott. He was helping her move to a hotel in Rill. Berry, Cindy and their two children were seen leaving the hostel for Colwyn Railway Station at around 3.15. Berry says they caught the 3.31 train to Rill. It arrived there at 3.46, nearly 10 minutes before the robbery was reported. Berry says it was starting to rain, so they waited for a cab. The taxi driver doesn't remember him being, as the prosecution were later to claim, flush with money. He struggled to pay me the fare, really. He didn't hand me a load of money or notes or anything. He turned to the lady in the back and asked her. The fare was less than 150, something like that. So if I were to say to you that, as so far as the police were concerned, he'd just robbed a building society of £600, he didn't look to you as if he'd got that sort of money on him? Yeah. Is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. You're laughing? Well, yes, I mean, uh, you know, the question really, more than anything. No, he wasn't uh, brandishing money around. Now, when the police questioned you, uh, did they ask you that, what I've just asked you? No, they didn't, no. Police never asked me that. Paul Berry got to the Richmond Hotel in Rill at around four o'clock, no more than five minutes after the robbery was reported. The hotel owner, a man of regular routine, remembers the events. I don't suppose I arrived back myself much earlier than, say, about five to four. How soon after you arrived back did he arrive here? All I can say is that I'd brought one lot of stuff in, I'd gone out, I'd brought another lot of stuff in, I'd then gone to fetch the carpet in, and it was then that Paul Berry arrived. So whatever timing there was between that, I, I don't know. So a matter of minutes, are we saying that? We're, we're, we're saying a matter of minutes, really, yes. From when you arrived back? Exactly, And yes. you're putting your arrival time at around 5 to 4, 4 o'clock, That's thereabouts. Right. Do you think there's any chance that Paul Berry committed this crime? No, I don't. You feel, you sound very sure of that? I do sound sure of it. In my own mind, I do not think he could have done the crime for the simple reason when the police said the timing of the crime, Paul Berry was here. On the face of it, then, Paul Berry appears to have been telling the truth that he was in Rill, 12 miles away, when the robbery happened. 
The only challenge to his alibi came from the story about the motorbike. This, the prosecution claimed, was how he'd managed to get from Colwyn to Rill and change his clothes, all in the space of around 15 minutes. However, no motorbike was seen. In fact, Rough Justice has discovered that the idea of a motorbike came not from any witness, but from the police themselves. There was a suggestion of a motorbike that the person who actually done the robbery used a motorbike to escape. This, this was during the first interview with the police. The police suggested that the to you? The police suggested to me that, it, that that's how it could have happened. The suggestion didn't come from you? Oh, no. Can you remember if the police asked you about a motorcycle at your first interview with them? One officer asked me if I'd seen a motorcycle. When this was, was when they took your first statement? That's right, yes. And that and was a matter of days after the robbery? That's correct, yes. So the idea of a motorcycle came from the police? Well, yes, I mean, uh, you know, I didn't certainly... It was, it was never mentioned before to me, so, it, you know, that was it. I mean, it, it's got to have come from the police because <laughs> I certainly didn't see one. I mean, you know, and it, it was mentioned to me in that police car. Three weeks later, from out of the blue, the police theory that Berry used a motorbike was turned into evidence thanks to the prison grass, Paul Crewe. Crewe claims Berry confessed to him while they were both on remand. Berry denies he ever spoke to Crewe. He says at best, Crewe may have overheard some prison chit chat during which Berry had discussed his forthcoming trial. We think Crewe's statement to the police was remarkable. In areas already described by witnesses, it was extraordinarily detailed, right down to the very words the robber was alleged to have used during the hold-up. He jumped up on the counter, holding a knife in a bag. He said, fill the bag up with notes, no coins. But in other areas, like the crucial motorcycle trip, Crew's statement was inexplicably vague. He got on the back of someone on a motorbike. He only said... Uh, he was a mate of mine. It was a big bike because he got back to real 10 minutes or so after the job was done. For a man who was ready to reveal so much, this particular passage from Crewe on the subject of Barry's alleged change of clothing was strikingly reticent. And later on that evening, he went out and he got rid of the gear he'd used in the job, you know, clothing and that. He had told me where this was stashed. But uh, at the moment, I'm not prepared to say where that is. There was no corroboration for any of the key parts of Crewe's statement. No other witness mentioned a motorbike. The police never even produced a trace of an accomplice. No clothes were ever found. What is so interesting about Crewe's statement is its timing, just shortly before he was due to be sentenced for the latest in a string of criminal deceptions. Crewe was questioned about this at the trial of Paul Berry. You are, Mr. Crewe, a person who practices deceptions. Is that not right? Yeah. And you have been convicted on a number of occasions for it? I have, yeah. Crewe's many criminal deceptions included extracting mortgage deposits from vulnerable women who he'd promised to marry. This woman was one of his victims. He sought her out through a Lonely Hearts column. He told me that he was quite high up in management for BT and he was thinking of relocating to the north of England and um, he asked me would I consider marrying him and moving into a new house with the children, um, more or less living happily ever after. Do you think Paul Crewe ever told you anything that was true? No, I don't think so. He didn't tell me his name was Paul Crewe. Oh, what did he, he tell told you? me his name was Paul Turner. What do you think he was looking for from you? I hadn't got anything, really. What, what little I did have, he did take. I had a few pounds in the house. After he was arrested, I found out that it had gone. If you heard that Paul Crewe had been uh, a witness of truth for the prosecution in a... <laughs> in a you're laughing, in a trial. Oh. No, I mean, w w what's your reaction? <sighs> I don't believe a word he says. I would never, ever believe anything that Paul Crewe says at all. 
He lives on lies. I don't think he knows what the truth is. So, for ten years, you have practiced and been convicted of deception. Yeah. And that is what you are doing now. For some possible benefit, or hoped for benefit of your own. Is it not? No, sir. But there's little doubt Paul Crewe did benefit. A few months before giving evidence against Paul Berry, he'd taken his own conviction to the Court of Appeal. The judges decided to cut his sentence by six months because, to quote them, of new information before the court. That's the sort of phrase judges use to indicate a prisoner has been helping the authorities. Crewe's ex-wife, whom he also cruelly deceived, told us he made a habit of it. He's definitely helped the police in the past because I've had CID officers at my house who showed me their identity cards and said that he was helping them with investigations. An informant? That's right, an informant's role, yeah. That's the role he was taking. But in any event, it's clear to you that he was an informer of some sort. He was at that stage. stage, without a doubt, yeah, because the police came and told me, yeah. Because the prosecution relied so heavily on Crewe to break Paul Berry's alibi, we went to talk to him. Crewe, you'll remember, had denied he'd given evidence against him in return for a shorter sentence. But to us, he admitted that's exactly what he'd done. We recorded the conversation secretly. So did the police say to you, if you help us, we'll get a reduction in your sentence? No. Well, what did they say to you then? They said I would have got a bit more if I didn't help them. It's the same thing, isn't well, it? Yeah, I suppose, yeah, yeah. No. Right. So you were expecting, in helping them, you were expecting to get not as long a sentence? Yeah, yeah. In view of what you've just told me, in view of the fact that you've admitted that you got a reduction in the sentence because of the help you gave the police. Mm -hmm. When you denied that you'd done this for some hopeful benefit, when you denied that on oath in court, that was a lie, wasn't it? No. Well, how would you describe it? If you want to take this matter up any further, you get in touch with Mr. Liz. That wasn't Crewe's only inconsistency. In his statement to the police, he said he'd approached them. But when we asked him, he said the police had approached him. You didn't approach the police officer no, about it? No, no. Are you sure about that? Yeah. yeah! Because that's what the police say, you see. They say that you approached them. Oh, no, definitely. No? Yeah. That's what you said in your statement. You said in your statement you approached the police. We were there were yet more inconsistencies. In his police statement, Paul Crewe claimed the wealth of detail had come from Berry. But to us, he said the complete opposite. So are you saying, are you saying, Paul, that every single line of your statement uh, was simply a response to something which the police put to you? Yes and no. Well, that's not how it read. But let me just ask you this. Is, is your, was your statement, every single line of it, a response to questions, information which the police already had and simply were seeking confirmation from you? Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Yes no. Is that yes or no? Yes. Right. So that's yes. The answer is yes. Paul Crew is a man to whom lying is second nature. His statement that broke Paul Berry's alibi was always too good to be true. But his lies were crucial in sending a man, whom we believe to be innocent, to jail. Paul Berry is no angel. He's a man who fiddles the system, making fraudulent claims for social security, rail travel, that sort of thing which is what he tried to tell the court. I didn't do it, he said. Armed robbery is not my style. So what exactly is the evidence that it was his style? Identification, notoriously unreliable and much of it tainted by the police. And a convincing alibi supported by independent witnesses, broken only by a professional liar. Paul Berry has served four years of a seven-year sentence. Miscarriages by misidentification are frighteningly familiar. That's why the Court of Appeal was founded nearly a century ago. We hope their Lordships will remember that if our evidence about Paul Berry comes before them. <laughs>